As an older millennial, TV is something that has always been in my life. But I also remember when TV, radio and video were the only forms of entertainment going. And magazines. Remember magazines? Some of my fondest childhood memories revolve around my TV. From me re-watching my favourite films on VHS on a loop, learning the scripts by heart, to staying up late so I could watch Euro Trash without my mum knowing, from looking forward to getting the new series of Friends on VHS at Christmas, to cosy nights in with my mum, watching Friday Night Comedy on Channel 4, to rainy school holiday day trips to the local blockbuster video. So, for this month's offering to the YouTube algorithm gods, and given that I am rather under the weather right now, I want to get cosy and talk about TV. Because, as an autistic, neurodivergent, introverted and nerdy kid, the world offered to me by films and TV was one where not only could I learn through repetition, re-watching and memorising my faves, where I could get to know different characters, even the kinds of people who would intimidate me in real life. But it was also a world in which kids like me, at least white kids like me, who were the awkward, nerdy ones, the kids who adults overlooked, and of whom other kids made fun. Those were the kids who got called upon to go on important adventures. The TV screen offered a world where their unique talents were noticed and utilised. I got to dream that a world like that existed, and I would find it one day. Growing up in the 90s was a time of classic movies and shows which shaped generations of people the world over, but it was also a time of prolonged moral panic about what this was doing to the psyche of the youth. A time when all kinds of societal ills were blamed on the generation raised by television. Welcome back to The Tech Report. Coming up later, you might have heard of the World Wide Web, but is it fad? The future, or maybe even the beginnings of a sci-fi-esque dystopia? We'll be talking to Professor Cornelius Dusty Oldman of Oxford University to find out more. But next, could TV be doing more harm than we already realise? New research by scientists suggests that small children should be kept away from the screen altogether. Experts in the field of television and children have raised fresh concerns and stark warnings this week in light of yet another crime. Something which, as we all know, never happened before the advent of television. Doctors across the country have attributed screen time to a variety of conditions including, but not limited to, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, Asperger's syndrome and autism, hyperactivity, lower IQs, behavioural issues and obesity. But now, could TV be creating a whole generation of serial killers? Our special report finds out. The history of generations being ruined by new technology is a long one. Famously, Socrates thought that books would ruin the minds of future generations. 
due to their not having to memorise knowledge anymore, and he thought that the written word lacked the nuances, intricacies and empathy of verbal speech. He warned that children would not be able to tell the difference between tales of fantasy and reality. We only know that now, of course, because Plato wrote it down. But essentially, it, it's a cliché at this point. New tech comes along and there's some kind of moral panic about it. The printing press was going to flood our wee brains with too much information. Newspapers would destroy the cohesion of communities as people would no longer get their news from the church. Steam trains were going to mash up our brains. Radio was distracting the youth from more important things and school and education in general was held as a risk to the physical and mental health of children and women by physicians. In 1883, one doctor published a piece that linked educating females to not only the collapse of the nation, but that it would also surely lead to the justified rape and kidnap of women from other countries. And, you know, I know this is only tangentially related to the subject of the video, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway, because I can't stop thinking about it. So as far as hard study goes, however, there is apt to be a certain sturdy conservatism about boys that prevents them from committing suicide by excessive brain work. The poor girls, with their nicer organisation, are the unfortunate victims. A few passages from an eminent gynaecologist merit more than passing attention. Our great-grandmothers got their schooling during the winter months and let their brains lie fallow for the rest of the year. They knew less about Euclid and the classics than they did about housekeeping and housework, but they made good wives and mothers and bore and suckled sturdy sons and buxom daughters, and plenty of them at that. From the age of eight to that of fourteen, our daughters spend most of their time in the unwholesome air of the recitation room, or poring over their books when they should be at play. When released from the school desk, the young girl exchanges scholastic for social ambition. Within a year, it may be, she becomes engaged to some unwary youth who, bewitched by her face and charmed by her intelligence, sees not her frail body. He weds her, only to find that she has brought him a dower of ill health, and that she has dared to assume the cares and cocks of married life with an underdeveloped reproductive organ, and with a large outfit of backaches and spineaches and headaches. If a woman is thus to be stunted and deformed to meet the intellectual demands of the day, if her health must be sacrificed on the altar of a higher education, the time may come when, to renew the worn-out stock of this republic, it may be needful for our young men to take the hint and to make matrimonial incursions into lands where educational theories are unknown and where another of the Sabines is possible. When learned and thoughtful men thus express themselves, the public ought to heed the warning they give. Speaking of learned and thoughtful men such as that, Thomas Radecki rose to fame in 1985 for claiming that the tabletop role-playing game, Dungeons and Dragons, was leading to an epidemic of violence, suicide and homicide among young men and boys. He was the research director for the International Coalition Against Violent Entertainment and founded the National Coalition on Television Violence and he teamed up with Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> to push for more oversight into the risks of violent and sexually graphic media from TV to games to comic books. Here he is, describing how important this is. Dr. Thomas Radecki of the National Coalition on Television Violence. He has pro participated in protests against comic books for their graphic depiction of violence. Catwoman in a, an S&M-like attire. Get ready, folks. Here's Superman with dynamite in the mouth. The Punisher, <clears throat> blood in the mouth. The Punisher, knife at the woman. 
And from Batman, we even have a naked man tied up. Things have changed. Okay, when we go out to bookstores, that's what we see. We find uh, 50, 100, 150 acts of violence per typical comic book. The average comic book is averaging about that many. I mean, you think that the kid reads a comic book in about 18, 19 minutes. He's getting an awful lot of violence in, in, in each comic book he reads. It's, it's really some of the most violent entertainment that's out there. Uh. So anyway, he's currently serving 11 to 22 years in prison for a variety of sexual abuse charges including his trading opioid addiction treatment drugs for sex through a program he ran in several counties called Doctors and Lawyers for a Drug-Free Youth. He also had his medical license revoked and got in trouble for claiming qualifications he didn't have. But you know, naked Superman. It's not like new technology never has any downsides, but... Electronic messaging being worse for your brain than drugs? Mm, ain't one of them. Moral panics surrounding television have existed as long as television and honestly don't really show much signs of going away. Violence and graphic images on television, even violence depicted in children's cartoons, has been cast as responsible for violence in real life, breeding a generation of mindless thugs. In the 90s, bad study after bad study circulated, with one researcher claiming that if we got rid of TV, all crime would be cut in half. The underlying philosophical methodology of the media at the time was to adhere to the ancient and infallible maxim, monkey see, monkey do. Life imitates art, Free will is a myth, and no, we don't really need to examine the socio-economic causes of crime, let's just ban TV. It really was a time of great minds and deep thought. There are downsides that come along with too much screen time. Being sedentary is something you should try to avoid if you can. Eyes do kind of need to look at things beyond the end of your nose on occasion. And there can be psychological impacts of TV, and even more so with social media, but this video isn't about social media, that range from increased FOMO to pretty devastating feelings of inadequacy, anxiety, and depression. But things were never as simple as just TV bad, or even social media bad. Unlike the terrible correlation is definitely causation style studies of the 80s and 90s. More recent meta-analyses find no discernible negative impacts on our health, attention span, violent tendencies or happiness that can be directly attributed to screen use. Again, that's not to say that there are no negative impacts of media consumption, but the authors of the analysis maintain that rather than ask, does screen time do X, we ask, what kinds of effects do different kinds of screen time have? After carefully analysing decades worth of studies, it was shown that rather than how much screen time you get, a more useful question is, what do you do with it? That's the thing that decides whether or not you will find negative or positive or neutral impacts from screen time. For example, it was found that those who passively scroll they will report feeling more lethargic and down after use. But those who use screens to engage with the wider world and the people within it in a positive manner are left feeling energised and happier after screen use. And that was the point, wasn't it? If screens, of radio, of engines, of the printed word, of works of literacy, of education, to better connect our world, to better inform the people within it, to improve lives and to create a more beautiful world in which to live. And nobody knows that more than the millions of people who do rely on technology for exactly those reasons. So would I say that I was raised by TV? I don't know. Maybe a bit. Like, if the generation raised by television applied to anyone, it was probably to kids like me. I was born in the late 80s and so lived through the heyday of the family film, 
the live audience sitcom. I saw the arrival of satellite TV and then obviously the internet. In the UK, I should add, there'll be Americans in the audience checking their calendars like, what? The point being that we were behind. Growing up in an ex-mining town in the middle of Derbyshire, whose only claim to fame was being next to a motorway junction, which had been called notorious, famously busy, and not fit for purpose, and an old windmill that isn't there anymore. We weren't exactly at the cutting edge of technology is what I'm saying. But while my mum couldn't afford it, my dad did have satellite TV and so from the age of about 10, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network and MTV were also regular parts of my media diet. And the idea of media shaping kids' minds, that meant a different thing to what it does now, I think. Like with social media, that's kind of curated for us as individuals. Granted, algorithms group us together based on a those who liked this liked that basis. But we can also unfollow, unsubscribe, curate our feeds ourselves if we want. Fashion has given way to individual aesthetic. And I think that the days of the international, global, household name celebrity are kind of over. It's at least the beginning of the end, I think. With more people able to contribute to media and art, and with a more curatable feed of media delivered straight to us as individuals, that is, not through a shared device in the middle of the room, the way that media shapes kids' minds is highly contingent on how they're interacting with media. But back in the day, it did come through that shared device in the middle of the room. The thing at which all the furniture points. We all watched one of a few channels. We all read one of a few newspapers or magazines. And it's not like we were conversing internationally on a regular basis like we do now. So we usually meant the people immediately around you. Now, people like to talk about pre-internet days as if people were all sitting around discussing highfalutin ideas with one another when in reality we were sitting around talking about what jeans the celebrities are wearing these days or what happened on this week's EastEnders omnibus. For those of you who don't know, an omnibus is when they used to take all of that week's episodes of a soap opera and play it all together like usually on a Saturday or a Sunday. It's what people did before Netflix invented binging. The popular shows were the popular shows and would be the ones that you would watch. The summer blockbuster movie would be the summer blockbuster and would be the one that you would get for VHS or DVD at Christmas. The vulnerable teenage singer whose studio execs decided would be the next star would be the next star. There's a reason why countercultures in the 80s and 90s were so strong. As well as economic reasons, art was under attack by capitalism, and for a long time, capital went undefeated in the realms of popular mainstream media. I personally think that this is starting to change. Maybe you do too, or maybe you think it got worse. Why not argue about it in the comments section? And while you're down there, like this video and subscribe if you're not already. See, is, is this more or less capitalism? I'm here, in my own home, with my own means of production, camera and stuff. I'm saying the things that I want to say in the way that I want to say them. Two people who pay me directly for the product of my labour, videos and stuff. But I'm also here telling you to please create a Google account. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is I prefer media now. These days I don't feel many limitations to the availability of the media I'd like to enjoy. I mean it is nice and nostalgic to think back on hunting through record shops, trying to find a CD from that obscure punk band from America, or those rainy day trips to Blockbuster. And there was something nice in those shared experiences of like 
everyone, it seemed, having watched the finale of the favourite sitcom the night before and getting together and talking about it the next day. But was that actually good? I don't know. I mean, on one hand, the internet has led to multiple misinformation movements that are based on just nonsense that people have been made to believe because the internet. But on the other, a centralised and limited source of media makes it way more easy for states and corporations to control. It's not like we were only told the truth pre-internet. In fact, if you think about it, many of the moral panics surrounding new forms of information distribution, you could kind of think of them as kind of like those who had control of the information freaking out over losing some of that control. Church and state and corporations and things. But besides that, it was a bit annoying, I seem to recall, all that traipsing around different shops looking for music. And I certainly wouldn't want to go back to my old CD case of 12 albums and my old Sony Walkman CD player giving up my library of literally tens of thousands of songs. Do I love that this library is controlled by a capitalistic enterprise who doesn't care about its artists or the safety of its audience in the cold pursuit of profit? No, but that's why I don't like all of capitalism. Imagine a Spotify or a Netflix owned and ran by its artists and workers. But the fact is that media does and will always go some way towards shaping minds and brains. But whether that's a bad thing or not, depends on the media and the brain. One of my favourite things to talk about is how autistic people learn stuff. I'm a person who has, I'm fairly sure, multiple neurodivergencies including learning disabilities. And as you can probably tell, I haven't let that put me off academia or tackling complex subjects. Because I know that needing some more time or a different learning methodology does not an unintelligent person make. I never spoke out about my learning difficulties as a kid because I saw how neurodivergent kids were ostracised and bullied. I was bullied and my bullies already had weird, awkward, ugly and fat in their repertoire, I didn't need to be adding anything else to the list. So I just tried harder, like really hard at school. And it meant a lot for me to do well. As I said, I was already weird, fat and ugly. I really needed clever under my belt. I mean, it was either that or funny. And as every 90s kid knows, girls aren't funny. So I was the kind of kid who spent their free time studying. My parents got me extra tuition so I could pass my maths GCSE. But I loved to read and write, even though I was a slow reader, my spelling was atrocious. And I couldn't remember a grammar rule if my life depended on it. I'm still a slow reader, still a bad speller. Half of my Google searches are just basic words that I've forgotten how to spell. But now I read and write for a living. Thanks to my patrons, please consider joining them in the link below. My first video on this channel, for example, I chose to write about how autistic people learn to recognise emotions and how it's a misconception that we can't. We just learn how to differently. Neurotypicals learn a lot of stuff about the social world and other people through osmosis. That is not particularly realising their learning, just picking stuff up naturally and without thinking. Coolness is a cool way to illustrate this. You can't explain why something's cool. There's no logical pattern by which you can predict what might be cool. Cool is something that can't be produced, but that occurs. It's about a shared feeling of being impressed by something, which is something that people usually just pick up on without thinking. It's just cool. But there are always reasons for the coolness. Cultural contexts and subcontexts, shared understandings and roots of ideas, 
What might be cool in one culture might be particularly uncool in another. And what is often deemed to be cool is usually dictated by the cool people of a dominant or hegemonic culture. But then, subversions of those reasons and paradigms is also cool, isn't it? Autistic people can often struggle with what's cool and why. Much of the social deficit linked with autism is just rather autistic people not really caring about the things their peers care about and also not being able slash not wanting to feign being interested in those things either. Autistic people learn with intent and we can be quite aware of our time being wasted. Autistic people are pretty notorious for having a low patience for things like small talk and often only having energy for things which we feel are worth our while. But that, that often translates into social skills. Autistic people are not antisocial, just as introverts are not all shy. Just because a thing might be difficult or take some more time or effort, that doesn't make it not desirable or enjoyable. In general, and remember with these videos, I'm never going to be talking for all autistic people, I'm only ever talking for myself. But in general, autistic people do want friends and a sense of community, and to enjoy having support structures and a sense of belonging. Shockingly. But apparently people do sometimes need to be reminded that we are human beings, and Human beings are social animals, despite what the libertarians have to say. But navigating neurotypical social spaces is really difficult. And as I talked about in my video on autistic masking and work, autistic people devise strategies in order to do so. This is not only a survival mechanism to prevent the ill health and pain that goes along with bullying and isolation, as well as to survive literal murder sometimes. But, <laughs> but certain aspects of masking, or adaptive strategies as we prefer on this channel, they're things like learning about people so that we can form healthier relationships with them. Autistic people might have a strong interest in psychology for this reason, and autistic people often use television, movies and social media to learn about the world and social interactions within it. To learn about customs, norms and expectations. Now I'm going to talk about the downsides to this a bit later because there are some, but let's face it, nobody doesn't learn through media. The difference for autistic people isn't in the fact that we do, it's how important it can be for us. Research into the effects of reading fiction have shown that reading works of literature can help increase your ability to form empathy with others by expanding your experience of the human psyche beyond your own experience and surroundings. Reading is typically thought to be good for you because of the basic fact that it expands your experience and every brain makes sense of the world through the experience the knowledge it has gleaned through sense data over the years. The more you feed your brain, the more things will make sense and the more things you'll understand. We read and watch fantasy and sci-fi to gain experience of that which we would never have any other way. In the philosophical study of aesthetics, philosophers forever have contemplated what is known as the paradox of tragedy which is essentially asking why we like stories that upset us so much. And in recent years, this paradox has been applied to horror. Why do we like watching stuff that makes us so uncomfortable? Why are the Saw films so popular? Why are we so morbidly curious as to allow there to be more than one human centipede film? Well, philosophers have ideas, as philosophers are wont to do. But I think most of us can just agree that we like to watch fantastical stuff because it's something we will never experience in real life and imagination is fun. And to experience tragedy and horror and terror from the safety of your own home is exhilarating. We get to place ourselves in the role of the apocalypse survivor. 
We get to picture ourselves, shotgun in hand, seeking out refuge from the zombie hordes or riding into battle on the back of a dragon. It's fun, but it's also important to us. It's why we've always made art and we learn about ourselves, what we fear, what we would brave, how we differ from the hero, how we relate to the villain. It's useful. But for autistic people, the concept of having a close friendship group of three to six people with whom you share everything, including the ins and outs of your vibrant dating life, and whom you trust completely, the idea of having people eager to hear about your day at your job, which might suck now, but has the potential to lead to a lucrative career by the end of the final season. That depiction of teenaged and adult life that is a staple of most TV series. To autistic kids, that can be as fantastical and magical and unlikely as riding a unicorn through an enchanted forest. But maybe it might not be, if we could learn how to be like that, if we could learn how these close friendship groups form and bond, if we could figure out what our place within that group would be, could we be the funny one, the oddball that everyone loves, would we, would we be the Sheldon? I wouldn't have minded being the Sheldon, to be honest. At least Sheldon had a successful career and a group of friends who cared. And he was a genius. Could I be a genius? Probably not. But maybe if I learned by heart how to do impressions of the cool people, then maybe people would find me cool too. Maybe if I spent time to learn all the jokes and funny references that everyone else just seems to pick up on, then maybe I could fit in and make those jokes too. Maybe if I flirted like the pretty one, and talked about men like the promiscuous one. And the thing is, it kind of works. A bit. Popular media is a huge part of the social zeitgeist at any given time, and general populations are shaped in ways by the media they enjoy, and it's a bonding and sharing experience to get the in-joke from the new comedy series. But for autistic people, I think films and TV did way more than that. In the realms of fiction, and especially in 80s and 90s family movies, autistic kids were not only able to learn about social interactions through observation and repetition, but they could actually see themselves as the protagonist. And at least to me, that opened up a whole new world of possibility and hope. So the kinds of shows and films that I loved as a kid basically make me the exact target demographic of Stranger Things. An awkward group of misfit kids who are usually bullied and overlooked get somehow chosen to go on adventures unbeknown to most other people. These are the kids that adults ignore, teachers neglect and peers ostracise. But they're also the kids who have read the right books, been curious enough to find the treasure, noticed the details which led to the clues, are clever enough to crack the code, or are unique in other special ways which have gone unknown, until a crucial moment where their unique talents are what is needed to save the day. At that point, all the people who doubted and overlooked them will realise that they are important and worthy of respect and community, and that the things which made them oddballs in the opening act were the exact skills which were needed all along. You can kind of see why these stories would especially appeal to neurodivergent kids, can't you? One day, that might be me. One day, my obscure knowledge and niche interests will be needed for important things. One day, all that time I spent by myself reading will bring wonder and magic into my life. And it's true that awkward, nerdy, introverted and autistic kids do sometimes go on to be innovators and inventors, celebrated experts in their fields and inspirational leaders. 
but there's something a bit great man theory-esque in that common hero's journey narrative though, isn't there? Special kids are chosen by special adults to do special things that advance slash saves all of humanity. And that kind of thing does sometimes bleed into the discourse within the autistic community I have come to find. On one hand, these stories offer hope, much needed hope, but on the other, they can sometimes fuel a kind of supremacist vibe, I'm sorry to say. A small group of selected individuals are the ones to do the important and exciting things. Everyone else is just background noise. But what if you're not one of the ones to be chosen? Does that make you background noise? The comfort that those stories brought is exactly why shows like Stranger Things and the perpetual nostalgia machine that is Disney Plus does so well. Because in light of the reality of life under late stage capitalism, sometimes you just need some comfort. When you learn that your special abilities will not be automatically rewarded by capitalism, when you learn that the circumstances of your birth mean more than some deus ex machina can save you from. When it becomes clear that you will not be plucked from obscurity, what then? And when it happens that despite all the practice, all the preparation, all the observation, all the building of those adaptive coping skills, it still doesn't stop people thinking you're weird because of your voice or your face when you still don't know how to keep a friendship alive. Because unlike TV, you're not just walking in and out of each other's apartments all the time. Kinda glad for that though, to be honest. When you have no dating life or small talk to bring up, when you still find yourself being pushed to the edges without knowing how to pull yourself back in, when things that are beyond your control are enough for other people to decide that you're simply not worth the effort. Allowing media to shape your perceptions of reality is A. Completely unavoidable if you're a human being with access to media and B. A risk. While all people who use and consume media are shaped by it in some way, Autistic people are way more likely to rely on media to form bonds, relationships and community. And I think we need to talk about the pros and cons therein. In my video, Autism, Identity and Community, go watch it at some point if you're interested, I discuss at length the importance of online spaces to the autistic population and how to judge people who rely on tech for communication for being to online is ableist rubbish. And I think the same about learning from TV. It can be informative, and as I've said here, it might be an autistic kid's only view into a dynamic and close friendship group. But it also comes with risks, like the health risks of sitting too long looking at screens, the mental health risks that come along with multiple forms of media, and of course the social vulnerability that might come along with social media. Autistic people are often made the butts of jokes online. Autism TikTok is a fave for cringe subreddits and montages, and autistic people can struggle with the influx of hate which can come their way. I think I actually know more autistic YouTubers who used to make content than who still do, and unfortunately, this is usually because they've become the target of harassment campaigns. But to an autistic person who struggles with social communication and reciprocation, who perhaps doesn't have access to neurodiverse spaces, who is used to being bullied and attacked, who expects to be ignored and judged, me pointing out that bad things happen online too, that won't really mean much to them. Real life is already more dangerous than any of these potential risks associated with screen use. Would you rather have a bad back and poor eyesight 
or know that you will be mocked and judged every time you interact with people. Social pain is real pain. That's kind of become a motto on this channel, but it's quite literally true. You can sit there and talk about how TV isn't real life and is it really learning about the world if TV is so far removed from reality? And do you know, I'd probably agree with you. It's less than ideal. And on a whole, I think it's safe to say that autistic people generally do realise this. But it doesn't really matter if real life spaces are dangerous and traumatic. If you want neurodivergent people to learn less from media and more from real life, then maybe we should make real life a nicer place to be. We all need to learn about the world. Nobody is born with knowledge and everybody learns in different ways. Autistic people need to put effort into learning stuff that others pick up on without thinking. But we do all learn and the intricacies of social interactions are no different. It's not human nature or common sense, it's a learned skill which you learned for reasons. So if you worry that autistic kids spend too much time online or looking at screens, then maybe we should work on creating a society that doesn't judge people for a lack of understanding which accepts that some people will need to be told things before they know it, and importantly, which deconstructs how it views things such as cool and weird. We should create a society which allows for, understands and teaches different communication styles, including non-speech forms of communication which accepts different learning styles as just a natural part of the variety of humanity and a society which, perhaps, places less value on cynicism and snide and more value on sincerity and joy. Because if society cannot or will not learn to accept and value autistic and neurodivergent modes of being, then of course we will escape. We will retreat into worlds where people like us are celebrated and valued, even if those worlds only exist via pixels on a screen or words on a page. Thank you, as always, for watching today's show, but don't go yet, as we have a special announcement. Now, we couldn't call ourselves The Tech Report and not keep up with the times, so I am extremely excited to announce that as of now, you can get your tech news online. That's right, we now have a website. So dial up the desktop and navigate to www.patreon.com forward slash Pondafor. Now remember that's all one word, no spaces. Join us on the World Wide Web for more from your favourite programme. Catch us again on The Tech Report. And remember, the future is now.